<laughs> Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now look at that. Do not be conformed to this world. What does that mean? That means you should not act the way this world acts. You should not think the way this world thinks. You should not want what this world wants. You should be thinking, desiring, and living on a higher level than the world. And you can, by being transformed, that means changed. That doesn't mean transgender. That means you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, your mind is a part of your soul. You are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit is the real you. Your spirit is who was born again when you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Your spirit will never die. Your mind, your will, and your intellect are a part of your soul. And we are told that our soul affects our body. What's the scripture say? As a man thinketh, as a man thinks, that's how he is. What you think about is what you become. But you need to transform what you become through the renewing of your mind. Now here's the deal. How do you renew your mind? You renew your mind through the washing of the Word of God. When computers first came out, there was a phrase that they used quite frequently, garbage in, garbage out. You're only going to get out of the computer what you put into the computer. You're not going to read something off the hard drive that wasn't written to the hard drive. Your brain is an organ. Your mind is is a part of your soul, and your mind is what determines what you decide. And when garbage comes in, what you need to do is have garbage go out. When truth comes in, you need to have the truth stay there. Every thought you have, you have a choice on whether to retain it or get rid of it. The Bible says, whatever is good, lovely, and pure. Think about these things. You know what? Think about this. If the world would think on good things, if the world would think the best of situations of people, the Bible says you shouldn't think of yourself better than somebody else. We are supposed to think of others better than ourselves. If you do that, how many murders do you think there would be? How many crimes, how many thefts, if you thought of other people better than yourself? Look, what you think is what you become. And what you think is based upon what you decide in the realm of the soul to keep in your head. So you think on whatever is good, lovely, and pure, and the Bible also says that any thought that comes into your mind that rises up against the knowledge of God, in other words, it conflicts the knowledge of God, you cast it down. You, here's what it says. You take it captive. You take it captive and cast it down. Now, you need to understand this. Doc can't fly. Now, he has an airplane. He can fly in an airplane, but he can't fly. If I said, Doc, I've got my Glock, Doc. 
and I want you to just put your arms out and flap them, and I want you to fly around this room or I'm going to kill you. Well, he can't flap his arms and fly around the room. You'd say, that's not fair, that's not just, that, that can't be done. Well, let me tell you something. God is never going to command you to do something that you can't do. Now, now, just think about it. If he commands you to do something, you can do it. If you don't, because you say you can't, you've lied to yourself. That means you have control over the thoughts. If God says, think on good things, whatever's good, lovely, and pure, if he tells you to do that, you must be able to do that, or he wouldn't command you to do it. If he tells you to take a thought captive that comes against the knowledge of God and cast it out, that must mean you can cast it out. I had a gentleman in my office. He's kind of an older guy. I mean, older than me. And uh, he was sitting in my office. And so don't be looking around at all the old guys in church thinking, was it him? But this guy's sitting in my office, and he says, he says, Pastor, I get up in the morning and I just think about naked women. That woke you all up, didn't it? He said, I think about naked women. And he said, sadly, it's not my wife. He says, I just think about them all day long. And he says, it's just tormenting me and I know it's not right. What should I do? I said, well, quit doing it. And he says, but I can't. I said, that's your first problem. You don't believe you can. That's not Frank either. Okay. <laughs> quit, quit trying to figure out who it is. Okay. <laughs> Who's that dirty old man in church? <laughs> Honestly, looking around, I don't see him here today. Okay. But uh, now you're thinking, okay, who is not at church <laughs> that's older than the pastor? <clears throat> okay. And he looked at me like, like a, a cow looking at a new gate. I mean, he had this look on his face like he'd never had that thought before. He said, well, what makes you think I can stop doing that? And I said, because the Word of God tells us that you control what you think. And when people say, well, I just can't help what I think, that's a lie. See, that, that's where the devil gets his foot in the door, or kind of like the camel gets his nose in the tent. He says, you can't help what you think. And you say, kind of like in the Star Wars movie, I can't help what I think. And you believe that liar, the devil. You believe him. And so you start basing what you're doing wrong on what he said instead of correcting it and doing what's right based upon the words, what the Word says. See, your voice, and I've, I've shared this many times with you, but your voice, your words override your thoughts. You start having lustful thoughts while you're driving down the highway and you're in the car all by yourself and you're daydreaming about something whatever. Well, just start quoting John 3.16 and meditating on it. I guarantee you, when you start speaking the word out loud, I said, don't think it, say it. And once you start saying it out loud, you find those thoughts go away. You say, well, but when I quit quoting the word, they come back. Well, then just keep quoting the word. You know, <clears throat> people... Uh, I, I get a lot of mail, and, and I think you all know that. And People ask me, <laughs> one person said, why are you so strange? Um, I heard you say one time that you used to be the pastor of a Southern Baptist church in Fortuna, Missouri. And to me, that's normal. And now... <clears throat> You're not normal. What happened? Well, let me tell you what happened.
I grew up in a, in a Baptist home. My, uh, my mother was a Baptist Sunday school teacher. My dad was an ordained Southern Baptist deacon. And uh, we went to a Baptist church in Raytown, Missouri. And I was uh, very active in, in the boys' Southern Baptist Royal Ambassadors. I went to a vacation Bible school at the age of seven. They had a guest minister come in, and it was in a, the vacation Bible school was in somebody's house. And I was seven years old, and he lined all of us kids up. He lined up all the chairs, and he preached a sermon to us that day on hell. And as I've shared before, he preached about it as though he had just gotten back. I mean, his hair was on fire and uh, scared me spitless. I mean, I was sitting there. I, I, he described the gnashing of teeth and the fire running out your eyeballs and everything. And, and <clears throat> so I went home that night after vacation Bible school, and I went into my, well, I was trying to go to sleep, and my sister, she's five years younger than me, so she would have been two and her crib or bed was in the same room, and she kept kicking the wall. Well, when she's kicking the wall with the lights out, and I've just heard this sermon about hell, it wasn't a happy thing. So <coughs> I got up, and I went into my mother's room, <coughs> and I said, Mom, I said, let me ask you something. I remember one time you told me about the Easter Bunny, you know, and then you told me he wasn't real. And then you, you told me about the Tooth Fairy, and then you told me that he wasn't real. And then you told me the story about Santa Claus. You told me all these stories, and, and you told me that they weren't really real. Well, let me ask you something. What about the devil and hell? She goes, oh, son, it's real. Well, that didn't help. And so I remember uh, she said, but son, you don't have to be concerned about that if you'll just believe in Jesus. And she shared how to become a Christian with me. And I remember kneeling down there beside my mother's bed at the age of seven, and I got saved. But you know, God put something inside of me, and maybe it's what some people call the calling. I don't know. I think it's inside of everybody if you just let it out. I wanted more. And I got saved, and, and I remember thinking, I, I, I know I'm going to heaven, and I used to ask myself, I know <laughs> as a young kid, I used to wonder when the people came forward in the Baptist church and they got saved, I was always curious why they didn't just as soon as they accepted Jesus, the pastor just pulled out a 38 special and shoot them dead right there on the spot. Because to me, you got saved and then you spent the rest of your life trying not to sin. Why, why not just send them to heaven while they're clean? You know? Oh, well. I used to think things like that. And so I wanted more, and uh, I was reading in my Bible one day that Jesus uh, taught in the temple when he was 12 years old. And I remember going to my pastor and talking to him about that. And he said, well, you just need to be baptized. And, you know, when you're 12 years old, we'll, we'll baptize you. So I waited until I was 12 years old. I knew that that wasn't my salvation, but I figured that when I got baptized, the clouds would part, and there'd be some kind of an appearance of angels singing heavenly songs. And uh, I was excited about getting baptized at 12. So they took us up to the First Baptist Church in Raytown, Missouri, because our church didn't have a baptistry at the time. And so we went up there in the afternoon. They had a huge auditorium. They didn't turn on the lights, and uh, I got baptized. Me and five or six other people. Well, I never will forget this baptistry had glass in the front and had lights in the water. And so it all lit up. And everybody got baptized. We had these white robes on, but I got a kid's robe. And the problem with the kid's robe is it didn't have the lead weights in it. And so my robe floated up on top of the water like a lily pad. And glass front and everybody's out there watching and I'm trying to keep my robe down and so when after baptism was over you know you got to watch what you say to kids kids are listening I was out in the parking lot when it was all over and my uh, piano teacher Mrs. Weston uh, her famous words to me staccato staccato um, 
as she snapped the back of my hand with that little plastic stick. At any rate, she was in the parking lot, bless her heart, and uh, she said, you know, when you got baptized, something happened. And I'm thinking, whoa, she saw a light from, she said, your feet came out the water. Did you know that, boy? How disappointing. How disappointing. I, I mean, she was kind of a dry, old, crusty lady. Uh, she, <coughs> she sang in the church choir. Uh, we, we, we had Sunday night services and didn't have air conditioning back in that day. And I never, <laughs> true story, she was standing on the back row in the choir singing on a Sunday night, <coughs> and a wasp flew up her robe and it looked like she got the holy ghost you know <laughs> and i you know she's up there dancing around and everybody says look at mrs weston she finally broke through you know and uh, of course if she would have broken through they would have kicked her out because that's what you do you know get the left foot of fellowship so i began my typical you know nothing really happened at the age of 12 and and I'm beginning to kind of get disappointed because I'm thinking in my mind, do you just get saved and then just kind of like hang on the rest of your life and try not to sin? I mean, there's got to be more to being a Christian than just saying, I received Jesus and it's over. So I uh, questioned quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I remember one time... I. I was al always had a music background, and uh, we were, me and some others, we were the special music at the Southern Baptist Convention. And it was in another state, it was out of town, and, and uh, they had an altar call at the end. And I went forward. Well, I went forward every time there was an altar call, anywhere, you know, even in my own church. Uh, if we had a guest speaker come in, I would go forward, you know. He always had one person come forward. It was always because I needed to rededicate my life because I need, you know how it is when you feel you need something but you just don't know what it is? And so I would rededicate my life every Sunday and it lasted till Tuesday. And, you know, I, I ran out of whatever it was before the next week and I had to do it again. And so I was, at the, for goodness sakes, I was the special music at the Southern Baptist Convention and I went forward. So I go forward, and they said, well, what do you want? And they gave me a card. You know those decision cards, and you check the boxes? Well, first box is, I want to get saved. I've checked that one before. I've done that. Next one, I want to get baptized, been baptized. Next one is, I want full-time Christian service. I'm thinking, well, I never checked that box, because who wants to be a missionary anyway? I mean, really? 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 Is what I used to think because missionaries back in those days it was the poorest people in the world living in the poorest countries of the world I mean it's the pictures you got of course they give you those pictures sometimes to raise money but as an impressionable kid that's the way I thought they lived they ate off of dirt you know so I didn't want to be a missionary but there wasn't any other boxes so I just checked Christian service because after all, nobody there knew me. I was out of state and all that. So the guy who was in charge of that meeting, he calls me up, and, and I'm just a teenager, and he calls me up, and he has this card in front of him, and he says, this young man's going to go into Christian service. You want to be a missionary? No. Well, he's going to be a, a pastor. He's going to be a, 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 a preacher. And uh, he doesn't know it, but I know his pastor back in Missouri, and I'm going to give him a call as soon as this service is over. So I went back to Raytown, Missouri, grade A, USDA approved, pasteurized preacher boy. And so at that time, I became a preacher boy. And so at church, they would have me do things from time to time. I remember one Sunday night, they gave me 10 minutes to do a sermon. And I struggled to fill it up. I read some scriptures two and three times. I mean, you know, when you just don't have much, you can't give much. And, wow. Well, needless to say, I went to Southwest Baptist University. Had to. My dad was a Southern Baptist deacon. My mom was a Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher. 
got saved in a Southern Baptist vacation Bible school, and so I'm going to go to a Southern Baptist college where I met a Southern Baptist girl studying to be a Southern Baptist missionary, and I was there, quote, as a preacher. And so we got married in a Southern Baptist church. I never will forget the first time Loretta and I were riding around in the car, and uh, I told her my testimony about how I had gotten saved and I gave the devotional at the boys' overnight. I mean, you know, I was telling her. And I played at the Southern Baptist Convention. And she said to me, she said, well, you know, I haven't done all those things, but here's what I do want to tell you. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and I speak in tongues. Well, I was in the Baptist Ministerial Alliance, and those two things don't mix. And so I remember as soon as she told me that, I was veering the car out of the ditch <laughs> and I, I quit taking her to church with me in college. I, I, I just quit taking her because I knew what was going to happen. The preacher was going to inadvertently say something about the Holy Ghost just casually and something would snap inside of her and she'd start rolling on the floor and swinging from the chandeliers and speaking in tongues and I'd be kicked out of the ministerial alliance and next thing you know I'd be in Vietnam with snakes and everything. no way. So I quit taking her to church, and, um, but I still wanted more. I wanted more. And so we got married in, uh, in a Baptist church, had two Baptist kids. I mean, I was Baptist. I figured if you weren't Baptist, somebody had been messing with you. You know what I mean? And uh, <laughs> of course, I had everything under control. I was a musician. In fact, for two years after... Loretta and I got married. I was the rock and roll act at Tantara in the auditorium for two years. Just imagine a white James Brown. <laughs> wow, I feel good. Okay, just, just, just imagine that with, with long hair. He's now your pastor. Okay, now, I was holy on Sunday morning. It was a holy terror on Saturday night. And, I, you know, I never did dr drugs or anything like that. I never, I never drank. I never smoked. I always used to carry a pack of Salem's in my pocket so people would think I smoked. Because when you're with that crowd, you know, they need to think. And my, my, my motto was Salem, but don't inhale them. <laughs> and uh, we <laughs> back in those days, oh, praise the Lord. I, d I was so dumb to the things of the world, but I tried to fit in with the world. You know what? And uh, as Loretta and I were walking down near Hippieville after a Jimi Hendrix concert one night, and uh, we it, at night we didn't live far from there in Kansas City, and and these two guys came up to us and says, <laughs> "Got any acid?" Well, I thought their battery battery was low in their car. I'm serious. And so Loretta was with me. I said, well, I think down at the Phillips 66 station they've got some. And the guy goes, whoa. I didn't know they had it. So they went off. I don't know what happened when they got there. Can we have some acid? <laughs> sure, bring your battery over here. Kids don't know what that is. Battery, acid is something you used to put in batteries in cars. It's back when they had dialing phones. Have you seen the video lately of, of the teenagers? They're in there, they, they got a rotary phone and they're trying to figure out how it works. <laughs> All right. I still have one in my house <laughs> that works. It'll work in the new system, by the way. But I knew something was missing. And uh, so I just, I became the pastor of the, Fortuna Baptist Church. I kind of quit rock and roll and became the pastor over there at the Fortuna Southern Baptist Church. And the two, two of the happiest days of my life was the day that I said, yes, I'll be your pastor. And the day I said goodbye. Because during the time I was there, I didn't really have a whole lot. Those people were good people and they came to church and, and they, were, they were wanting something. We all came to church and and we, we had less when we left. 
it seemed like, than what we had. With, you know, it, that, that was the way it was. So I went back to college. I thought maybe education was the answer. You know, worship at the altar of intellect. Get a degree. Be a theologian. Maybe then you'll know more about God. And so I went back to Southwest Baptist University a second time to get a major in theology. And there I met, when I went back, I met Dr. Jerry Horner, who, by the way, is still out preaching the word. I believe today he's in Indonesia preaching. But he was my professor. And when I went to school there before, uh, a few years before, his classes were kind of boring. And I, and I say that respectfully. It was probably me, you know. The problem was me. But when I went back this time, I noticed that I had him for a couple of classes, and I go, oh, okay. So I went into his class. One of his classes was on the book of Hebrews, and it was an hour and a half class at the university, and I sat there, and it was like it was over in five minutes. And I'm thinking, what, what, whoa, what? This guy, something's happened to this teacher. Something's happened. He's not the same person he used to be. So uh, I was pretty good at ping pong. Many of you know I won the Puerto Rico championship for ping pong, <laughs> table tennis. At any rate, so we were playing uh, table tennis. I was playing him between classes. And I said, Dr. Horner, let me ask you something. Something's changed in your life from when I was down here before. Something's different. Please tell me what happened. And he said, well, I can tell you a couple of things that have happened in my life. He said, here's one of them. He said, uh, I've started speaking at some other places, full gospel businessmen. And he said, uh, I was out of town. He had an MG. He said, I was out of town uh, speaking, and I knew that my car needed repair. And I was on my way back home. It was a holiday weekend. He said, I'm traveling in the middle of the night in roads in southern Missouri. And keep in mind, 40 so some years ago, uh, if you had a foreign car, there's no place to get it fixed. If you didn't have a Chevy or a Ford, you couldn't get it fixed in Missouri in the Ozarks. And so he, he said as he's coming home, uh, the car starts da -da 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 as he's going uphill, and there's no curb to pull off or anything. And, and he said, I've never done this before, but I ne negotiated with God. I said, God, Father, there, I know that I should have gotten this car serviced. I've known that for months. And I haven't. I've put it off. I've been slothful in that area. But if I promise you, if, if I can just get home tonight, then Monday morning or as soon as the dealership opens up in Bolivar, Bolivar Missouri, uh, Bill Roberts Chevrolet, as soon as that opens up, I'll get the car over there and I'll get it fixed. I'll get it tuned up and whatever's wrong with it, I'll get it fixed. I don't care how long it takes. If they got to order the parts, it doesn't matter. I'll get it done. He said, instantly. It just start, mm, started running perfect. Now, here's this college professor telling me this. Now, this college professor is not a weird kind of college professor like you see on television, you know, with long hair and dreadlocks and, and you know, sandals and cutoffs. No. I mean, he was really straight-laced, almost nerdy i hope he doesn't see this okay but 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 nerdy in a good way all right so he said it started running perfect he said it, in fact it was running so perfect that on the way home i'm thinking why why am i going to go get this thing fixed i mean it's it's running perfect now well the weekend was over he got home the weekend was over and so he decided, well, I'm going to take it up to Bill Roberts Chevrolet and have him take a look at it. So they take it up there, and uh, the mechanic comes around the corner and said, uh, Dr. Horner, who towed you in? And he said, no, nobody towed me in. I drove the car in. He said, now look, he said, if you used another tow service, I'm not upset with you because our tow truck, we have, they had one tow truck, our tow truck is up at Deepwater, Missouri, and so I know we didn't tow it in, but I'm just curious who you got to tow it in. He said, I didn't have anybody tow it in. I drove it in. 
He said the mechanic held out his hand, opened it up, and the rotor was crumbled. And he said, inside your distributor cap, the rotor is in pieces. He said, look, I'm not calling you a liar. I just want to know. The engine is cold. There's no way it would run without a rotor. Who towed you in? He said, that's when I knew. He said, I knew that I knew that I knew that God was supernatural in this day and time. He told me another story. He said he was speaking at a convention just a few weeks before, an outside convention, and there were two girls who came who were teenagers, and they were either on drugs or they were drunk. And they were mocking him while he was preaching. And one of them stood up and said, Hey, if God was in this bottle, and he stuck their finger in this bottle, said, We could just keep him in here forever. And she couldn't get her finger out of the bottle. So he, they, he said they were just kind of wandering around out there drunk, and this girl's got her finger in the bottle, and her finger's all swelling up. She can't get it out of the bottle. And they don't have enough sense to get a hammer and break the bottle or whatever. You know. So they get in the prayer line at the end. They get in the prayer line. So they're bringing people up on stage. This is a big convention type thing. They're bringing people up on stage. And this is something he taught me. You know, there's some things that you can learn from these saints from our elders, if we just listen, little things. He, he said, you're not going to find in the Bible where people closed their eyes and looked down when they prayed. He said, you'll find in the Bible that they lifted up their eyes into heaven and they spoke. He said, the Lord's been dealing with me on that. And so he said, I've been praying. Now, this is a Baptist, and Baptist always, you know, it's like this. And I'm not critical of it, I'm just saying... Bow your head and close your eyes and that type of thing. He said, I've been praying with my eyes open. He said, let me tell you what happened. Those girls came up there on stage. He said they were slightly intoxicated, but they came over mockingly and said, can your Jesus get my finger out of this bottle? And he said, I reached out. He says, the girl laid the bottle and her hand in my hand. And he said, I spoke the word of God and commanded that finger to come out of the bottle. He said, now here's the thing. When I did that, my eyes were open. And he said, what happened was her finger dematerialized. It just became invisible and reappeared on her hand outside the bottle. Outside the bottle. Well, I'll tell you what, when a guy who's looking for answers, here's a couple stories like that from a college professor who was head of the <coughs> theology department at Southwest Baptist University, who later became dean of theology at Oral Roberts University, and later Pat Robertson hired him to start his Regent University, and that's why Loretta and I were on the board up at Regent University was because of him on the president's board, council. Let me tell you something, when you hear that, and you know that you're searching, I started searching. And I started saying, God, look, I, forget, forget that I'm a Baptist. Oh, I think God had already forgot that. I said, you know, just, just forget the title. I, I don't, the title means nothing. It doesn't matter if I'm a Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Catholic, whatever. It doesn't matter. What I'm seeking is you. What I'm seeking is you. And if there's anything else, Father, miracles, I want to see it. If there's a healing that takes place. I'm tired of hearing about somebody's neighbor in Omaha that had a sister that knew a cousin that got healed. If there's a healing going to take place, I want, I want to see it. I, I know the Bible says it's better not to see, to believe without seeing, but I'm at a place, Father, I'm kind of like Thomas. I'm at a place where I need to see myself. I'm tired of hearing the stories. I want to see. I said, look, if any of this is real, even, and I started to say speaking in tongues, and I'm driving in the car by myself talking to God, and I couldn't get the words out. You know, even because I remembered Loretta, 
I mean, if I turn this thing loose on the world, you know, here you go. So, even speaking in tongues, okay, if it's real, I'll receive it. When you start praying that prayer, when you, when you sincerely make that con confession, I'm talking to people who are born-again believers. You make a statement to God, whatever you have, I'm ready for it, whatever it is, you just better strap in yourself with a heavy-duty seat belt and shoulder strap because the ride's getting ready to begin. And I'm telling you what, over the next few months, there's not enough time for me to go until midnight tonight to tell you all the stories of things that happened. The very, very next Sunday at the Baptist church we went to in Versailles, at the very next service, a demon-possessed girl shows up. Hello? What a coincidence. And then God started working on the inside of me, like telling me I needed to minister. The next Sunday we go, we're sitting up in the balcony. We're sitting in the balcony of the, of the church in, in Versailles. And at the end of the service, I mean, we had our normal service. The deacon of the week got up because the deacon of the week always gets up, you know, and, and he says the closing prayer. And you can... You know how that rain machine sounded a while ago that she had? Well, you could hear cellophane wrap, wrappers, you know, whenever they said the closing prayer. That was all those Winston packages, you know, they grab a hold of. And so, at any rate, never mind. The, uh, the deacon of the week, he gets up and he says, <laughs> he says, do we have any prayer requests? Well, they say that every week and they never had any prayer requests, you know. He said, do we have any prayer requests before the closing prayer? And this man who was down under the balcony, and he was a, f a farmer, obviously. He had bib overalls and a white T-shirt, good-looking, clean guy, tall, older, older gentleman. And uh, he just said, excuse me, and he just walks all the way down the aisle up to the, to the front, stands right in front, stands right in front of the pulpit, the podium. And he turns around, and Loretta and I are up in the balcony. And he turns around, and he said something along this line. He said, he said, I've never been to church much in my life. Later, found out, never been to church. He said, never been to church much in my life. But I do go to the doctor. The doctor says, I'm going to die. And I said, Doc, isn't there anything that you can do? Isn't there anything at all you can do? And he said, Doc looked back at me, and he said, whatever his name was, your only hope is God. He said, well, you know, coming into the feed store here in Versailles, he said, every week I drive past this big old white church building here, he said, I got to thinking about what the doctor said. And I got to thinking, well, if God's anywhere, he's probably there. So here I am. Well, it got quiet in that church. And I'm up there in the balcony, and I didn't have much. I mean, I'm just coming into all this. And I'm thinking to myself, what, what's going to happen? Now, here's, here's the deal. There were... There, back behind the pulpit, there was a door on either side. That's where the choir came in and the pastor and all them came in those doors. There was a door on either side, and there were two doors under the balcony to exit that church. Well, the, the deacon of the week, he just said, <coughs> okay, l l let's pray. And he did his little 10-second prayer, and he said amen. And when he said amen, I'm looking down from the balcony, and it's like that, that, farmer is the hub of a spoke wheel and everybody just kind of meandered off from him they went to everybody went toward an exit nobody went in front of him nobody went to him i mean the deacon of the week the pastor pastor sitting on a red velvet chair back there i mean they all got up they went out their exits everybody went out and that man's left standing there and i remember saying to loretta somebody's got to do something i don't remember exactly what happened 
But I, I think the way I remember it, I tried to get down there. But you get down through the crowd that's going down that little staircase to get down to the lower level to get out of the church. And by the time I got down there and looking around, the guy was gone. Couldn't find him anywhere. And it made me start thinking this question. Where's the power in the church today? Hey, where is the power in the church today? That man, bless his heart, I don't know what happened to him. Never did find out. I asked, I asked the pastor, I asked deacons, and I was basically nothing in the church. You know, we just, we just went. Uh, I mean, we helped out a little bit, taught classes from time to time, but, but nothing super big. But nobody knew anything about this man. But he thought to himself, huh, if God's anywhere, he's probably in that church building I go past on the way to the feed store every week. We've got to start asking ourselves this question. If that happened in your life, if that happened here, what would you do? What would you do? What would the church do? Now, now, don't take me wrong. I'm not against that church in any way. I know people that go to that church to this day. I love them. There's no problem there. People are getting saved at that church. The kids are being raised right. Think good things are happening there. But I wanted more. I wanted to, I wanted to see a miracle in my life. I had family members that needed miracles. I had people in my family that needed their hearts healed. My grandpa committed suicide. It's a weird deal about Climax Springs. They named a street after him where he committed suicide. But that affected our family. There's got to be something more than just going to church and singing in the choir, and fellowship dinners. I love fellowship dinners, but, and people ask me, they say, why do you never focus? And, and I, look, I love everybody, but just let me tell you this. I do get criticized sometimes because I'm not as social-minded as a lot of churches are. I, I don't, my first thought in the morning is not when can we have a fellowship meal. My, my first thought is why can't we do an outing? Outings are good. We need fellowship. The men's meeting, the ladies' meeting, all these things are good. But I'm, I'm looking for the power of God to be manifest in my life and in your life. I, I want to see some big things happen. I mean, if all we want is spaghetti dinners, just join the Lions Club, for goodness sake. You, you know what I'm saying? We need more than that. We should be the place where people can come and get healed. We should be the place where people come and their broken heart gets healed. We should be the place where the destitute come and we can help them. Because we represent the God who created this universe. Of course, Sometimes you get a little goofy when you're wanting things to happen. And I've gone through my goofy stages. You know, so if some of you hear stories about me 40 years ago, they're probably true. Because, well, Loretta had a German shepherd that was missing. And, uh, and I, I, I'd, I'd started seeing some things happen. And experiencing some things. And I'd gotten filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and I was excited. And Loretta had this German Shepherd dog. And it was missing. After a Bible study one night, we couldn't find it. And we lived down on the lake. And, and there was woods all around us. And so the next day I went out. And I'm looking for the dog. And I walk up our driveway. There's no houses or anything. There's a few houses in a little development not too far from us. And I'm walking. And I'm looking for this German Shepherd dog. And... It's named Candle, and Loretta loved this dog. It was her pride and joy. And so uh, I saw a tree off in the distance, kind of clearing around. There's a tree, and there's a few houses over there. 
and I saw the dog laying down asleep under the tree. Oh, so I thought. And as I get closer, I can hear flies. And I realize that the dog's dead, and rigor mortis is set in, and it's kind of laying there all, you know, kind of laying on the ground, kind of all s stretched out. And so I'm thinking to myself, well, what Jesus said, these signs shall follow those who believe. They'll lay hands on the sick. They'll raise the dead. Think, well, you know, if you could raise a dead person, you could raise a dead dog. So <coughs> I thought to myself, well, you know, there's houses over there, and there's a guy out watering his lawn and everything. So, and I'm across the street over here with this tree and the dead dog. And so I don't want to cause too much of a commotion, so I just say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak to this dead dog, and I command it to come back to life now in the name of Jesus. I hear the flies. <laughs> think, well, that's not working, you know. So maybe if I said it a little louder. So I turned so that the guy over there wouldn't hear me. I said, in the name of Jesus, dead dog, rise. I hear the flies. So I thought, well, you know, wait, wait, wait. The scripture says lay hands on. So I thought, hey, I'm just going to cut loose. So I got down on one knee. I put the charismatic grip on that dog's head. I, <laughs> I flung my other arm up in the air, and I started speaking, In the name of Jesus, candle dog, I command you. Now, in the name, rise and behold. Well, see, the whole thing was, I was more scared of Loretta than God on this whole deal. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I didn't want to come back home and say, here's your dead dog, you know. <laughs> but I had to. You know, and let me tell you what happened. I started bargaining with God. And I said, God, here's the deal. You, you, because I was thinking about starting a Bible study, which we did, that ended up being this church. I said, Lord, if you will raise this dog from the dead, so I don't have to go home and face Loretta with a dead dog, you'll raise this dog from the dead, I'll start a ministry. If it develops into a church, you know how I feel about churches? If it, if it develops into a church, so be it. If I even end up having to be the pastor, so be it. If you'll just raise this dog from the dead, I'll do anything you tell me to do. Let me tell you something. God spoke back. I did not hear an audible voice coming out of heaven, but I heard a voice so clear in my heart. And you can hear the voice of God clear in your heart. And he said, okay, let me get this straight. If I raise this dog from the dead, you'll do whatever I ask you to do. I raised my son from the dead. Was that not enough? So let's, let's get this straight. I can raise my son from the dead, and you won't do what I tell you to do. But if I'll raise a dog from the dead, you will? Well, I tell you what. I've never been a Catholic, but I did everything but drop on my knees and cross myself and, <laughs> and yell for forgiveness. I tell you what. It, when God speaks to you like that, and so here we are. Like I say, I've got stories that are so phenomenal of things that have happened. I've seen, I've seen things that physics cannot explain. I've seen the glory of God. The glory of God appeared in our hotel room in Springfield, Illinois. I saw a man completely crippled from birth, twisted around on stage in Quincy, Illinois. Every bone in his body straightened out, and he became perfectly whole, complete, 
I saw that. It happened right in front of my eyes, in front of the eyes of everyone in the room. I have seen things, but let me tell you something. I am now satisfied knowing that my God has no limits. And I serve a limitless God. And there's no need he can't meet. No fear I have that I can't conquer because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And it's not about me receiving gifts of the Holy Spirit or, or me doing whatever we're doing. No, my life, it's all about him. And so if you think I'm a little strange, blame God because he made me this way. He made me this way. And uh, that's why our church is different. I, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, there are books out there on how to grow a church, and we could buy those books and have seminars and pass them out, and we could fill up every seat in this auditorium and have to build a, build a new auditorium. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But my goal is not the quantity. My goal is the quality. I was telling Loretta the other day, I said, you know, in our church, we have mature believers. In our church, we've got people with depth. of the. We've got people that are hungry for the word of God. This is not just your social club here. This is a group of people that are wanting more. They're wanting more. And you know what? No matter how much you have, there's more. That's the good thing. You, you never totally attain everything that God has for you because there's no limit to what he has. And what you used to think, listen, what you used to think is impossible, now you know it's not impossible. It's possible. And these age-old excuses of, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too short, I'm too tall, I'm too black, I'm too white, I'm too yellow, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too whatever, none of that holds up. Because none of that matters to God. He doesn't look at those things. Listen, the Bible says it clearly. Man looks at the outside. The outside's irrelevant to God. All he's looking for is somebody that will believe him. The Bible tells us he'll pass over a million people. Probably a, a million people with theological degrees, people who go to church a lot, looking for one person that will stand up and say, I believe you. I believe what you said. When you said this in your word, I believe it. That's faith. Luke 18, 8, Jesus made this statement. He said, when the Son of Man returns, we're talking about when he comes back, and Jesus is coming back. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I know we talk a lot about faith, and the name of our church is Walk on the Water Faith Church, or Wow Faith Church. And we know that we are faith people. But from time to time, I'll hear someone say, is faith really all that important? Let me tell you something. It's the one thing that Jesus is going to be looking for when he comes back. Luke 18, 8. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find those who believe him on the earth? That's what he's looking for. Wow. Are you a believer? Stand up. Repeat after me. I believe everything God says solely because God said it. Isn't that good? Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We give you all the honor. We give you the praise. Bless these, your people, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. My dear brother back there, wave your hand. Yep, back row. You, glasses. Short sleeve shirt, wave. Yeah, you, all right. While I was speaking today, I heard the Lord speak to my heart and say that there is coming a time shortly in your life where you're going to have to make a decision. Somewhat major decision. What about? He didn't say. But here's the thing. When you reach that place of decision, 
you remember back to today because today the Lord is telling you when that time comes seek me and I'm not talking about a 10 day fast or anything I'm just talking about you just say father you give me guidance you seek me says the Lord and I will lead you by my spirit in the way that you should go and the decision that you thought would be difficult will actually be easy and this is for me when it happens let me know all right God bless you all we have um, the prayer tower is open we're ready for ministry if you would like to have prayer today if you'd like to become born again we have ministers there who will guide you into salvation if you need healing in your body they'll anoint you with oil if you need the prayer of agreement as it says in Matthew 18 19 we will agree with you according to the will of God and God will meet your need give somebody a hug right now come on give somebody a hug God bless you all love you <laughs>